If you have ever watched the Back to the Future movies, you might have fallen in love with Doc Brown's whimsical house. But how much do you know about its history? Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to This House. Today we are exploring the home of David Gamble in Pasadena, California. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. David Gamble was born into new money. His father, James Gamble, had emigrated to Ohio from Ireland as a young boy and started a candle and soap business with his brother-in-law, William Proctor. When the American Civil War broke out, the duo won a contract to provide Union soldiers with their products as Proctor and Gamble. The company never stopped growing as it developed into a multi-billion dollar, multinational corporation. James Jr. ended up taking over the business when his dad passed away, but his brother, David, sought a simple life despite his inherited wealth. While the wealthy were still building grand estates, he wanted a house that tied back into nature, something large enough to entertain in, but humble enough to call home. In 1908, he hired the architecture firm Green and Green to design for him a home that was a total rejection of Gilded Age glamour. Much like the philosophy of Frank Lloyd Wright designing homes to be in harmony with nature, the Gamble House took a less modern approach. It was designed in the arts and crafts style to seamlessly blend interior and exterior spaces in a rustic manner. Porches protruded from several rooms under extending eaves to provide shade while terraces on the ground floor were designed to be freeform, built to accommodate the natural features of the landscape, with architectural elements framing the natural fauna. The interior of the house, unlike those of Frank Lloyd Wright's, was organized off a central stair hall and finished out with wood panels, some of which concealed secret doors and closets. The stairs wrapped around built-in seating, with a railing which stepped with the stairs. Wood beams created a coffered ceiling, devoid of ornamentation, to call out the geometry of the space in three dimensions. At the end of the hall, giant art glass doors swung open to allow the room to continue into nature. The dining room contained furniture designed by Green and Green to complement the architectural features. The large tiled fireplace contained asymmetrical inlays with glass cabinets set at eye level on either side. The large lantern suspended over the table was tied with fabric from hooks, lending even the smallest details to accommodate the rustic aesthetic. In the living room, exposed beams bent in a fantastical bow to divide the main living space from its bay window, while wood panels rose three quarters of the way up the walls. This design was mirrored on the other side of the room, but this time, to divide the hearth from the main living space with bricks which had been stacked vertically, creating a clean and modern grid. Going upstairs, following the zigs and zags of the stair railing to monolithic newel post, the wood wall panels terminated at the height of the banister, below a picture rail, and squared off crown molding. The bedrooms were designed to contain a generous amount of space and were finished out with even simpler details, carrying out the rule of threes for which the house was themed. With three sets of molding on the walls and three distinct uses for the hearth wall, one section to be left blank, one section for the fireplace, and one section for built-ins. Another bedroom was considerably more modern, with wicker furniture and a simple arts and crafts style bed set over carpeted floors. An entire wall was devoted to function with closets, built-ins, and a fireplace, all set between the baseboards and the picture rail, allowing the blank section of the wall to tie the room back together. Now that the house was complete, it was time to unveil it to the public. People were anxiously awaiting the grand reveal, expecting a palatial estate from one of the country's wealthiest heirs. Critics broke the news that the house was a travesty. It was a complete and utter rejection of traditional architecture and current trends. They mocked its simplicity and lack of luxurious finishes even though the wood types used in the house ranged from mahogany to teak. But this did not upset the Gambles. They had built their winter home in a style that they loved and returned every year until they passed away in the 1920s. As it continued to pass through family, the house became increasingly popular, and by the end of World War II, it was viewed as an inspiration for mid-century modern homes around the country. The home was eventually left to Cecil and Louise Gamble, who decided to put the house up for sale. But upon overhearing prospective buyers as they talked about painting all the woodwork white, the Gambles decided to pull it off the market and donate it to the University of Southern California to be preserved. Later on, in 1985, the exterior of the house gained further recognition when it was used to depict Doc Brown's house in the Back to the Future movies. 
but nothing compares to visiting the Gamble House in person, as it is currently open to the public with guided tours and retains much of its original interior as a very early example of what we might consider a modern home. If you have ever visited, I would love to hear about your experience at the Gamble House down below in the comments section. And while you're there, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. I would also like to take a moment to say a special thank you to our This House supporters whose names you can see on screen right now. If you would like to see your name on the screen, please consider joining our membership program today. I'll see you next time on This House.